I just want to welcome everyone um, and thank you for being with us here. Um, I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. Today's presenter is Garrett Graff. He is a distinguished magazine journalist, best-selling historian and regular TV commentator who has spent more than a dozen years covering politics, technology, and national security, helping to explain where we've been and where we're, we're headed. He serves as the director of the Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Program and is a contributor to Wired, Longreads, and CNN. He's written for publications from Esquire to the New York Times and served as the editor of two of Washington's most prestigious magazines, Washingtonian and Politico Magazine, which he helped lead to its first national magazine award, the industry's highest honor. His most recent book, an instant New York Times bestseller and number one national bestseller, The Only Plane in the Sky, an oral history of 9-11, compiling the voices of 500 Americans as they experienced that tragic day, was called a priceless civic gift by the Wall Street Journal. Graf is also the author of multiple other books. A Vermont native and graduate of Harvard, he taught at Georgetown University for seven years, including courses on journalism and technology, and his writing and commentary has appeared in publications such as the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone, USA Today, GQ UK, among others. And he has appeared on CBS This Morning, The Today Show, Good Morning America, CBC, the BBC, Al Jazeera English, the, English, the, the History Channel, National Geographic, and various NPR programs. His reporting has been cited on shows ranging from Stephen Colbert, to John Oliver, to Rachel Maddow. He also is the chair of the board of the National Conference on Citizenship, a congressionally charted civic engagement group founded by Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower and serves on the board of Vermont Public Radio and the Burlington Housing Authority. We are thrilled to have you as our guest tonight. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks so much for that uh, very generous uh, and detailed introduction. Um, so I, uh, I am pleased to get the chance to to chat with you all today. Um, I'm at my uh, house in my office in Burlington, um, and so sorry I'm not down south with you all uh, there. But um, we have a great sized group today, so um, I would uh, encourage you all, as you feel comfortable, uh, to ask questions uh, along the way, um, and we can try to keep this as informal. Uh, a conversation as uh, as is possible over Zoom. So uh, raise your hand, uh, chat your questions, uh, um, however you want to send them. Um, but this will be a, this will be more fun and more interesting uh, if we are able to have a little bit more of a conversation and uh, dig into the questions that you guys are particularly interested in along the way. So um, thanks to Gloria. Um, uh, and the team for inviting me. I, I am talking uh, today about the very straightforward and small definable uh, topic of the health of democracy and the role of political journalism, uh, a topic uh, of which uh, there's almost nothing to say, and I'm sure none of you have any opinions of your own uh, about any of those topics, um, but I will do my best to soldier through um, and find something interesting to say about democracy and journalism in 2021. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Gloria gave a very generous uh, professional resume, but I wanna talk a little bit about how I come at these issues and, and my background um, covering some of this. And then um, what I was going to try to walk through were um, a series of uh, w what I see as uh, geopolitical shaping uh, trends that we are wrestling with in our modern world right now, and then some specific media trends and developments that we are seeing play out um, in, in the media industry specifically. So. Um, my background, uh, as, as Gloria said, um, is primarily as a magazine journalist. Um, I oversee uh, and help manage uh, as well today the 
technology and cybersecurity program at the Aspen Institute um, and uh, have spent you know, most of the last 15 years writing about the intersection of technology, politics, and national security. Um, so most of the work that I do is more focused at that geopolitical and the strategic level um, rather than the horse race coverage uh, of American politics. So I'm sort of much more focused on the larger trends shaping our world um, and, and our economy than I am the the day to day ins and outs of uh, you know the Republican negotiations today on the infrastructure package and whether that's going to be 1.6 trillion or a trillion or 800 million and where the paygos are going to come from and uh, all all of those questions. So I'm happy to dive a little bit more into day-to-day -day politics, but most of this conversation is going to be at a, a slightly higher level. Um, so uh, we, we are living through, uh, and this will surprise none of you, uh, an incredibly challenging uh, time in the world uh, technologically right now. Um, and we are seeing a rapid pace of change that is disrupting American politics and world politics in ways that are unfamiliar to us uh, in modern history because we've never seen technology change and shift as quickly as it has over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when you look back at the pace of technology, uh, we are seeing the uh, deployment and adoption of technology happen uh, far more rapidly than we are used to. Um, it took cars 55 years from the time that they were first commercially introduced until they reached a quarter of the population. It took electricity 46 years. It took television 26 years. It took computers just 15. It took cell phones just 13. And broadband reached a quarter of the population just six years after its commercial uh, adaptation. Um, and so uh, when we say that sort of the world is being challenged by the pace of change, that's what we are talking about is that these new technologies are changing the way that we communicate. They are operating faster and coming into the public sphere more quickly than pol public policy can answer them. And so we are finding ourselves sort of wrestling with the effects of technology long before public policy makers are really able to think creatively uh, and constructively about what they actually are, are doing to our lives. So um, the, the challenge that that is presenting and creating right now is that we are seeing the, uh, our human mind and the collective social imagination pale in comparison to the ways that our lives are changing. Um, and that that is something that politicians are not very good at handling. And so we are seeing economic disruptions, we're seeing political disruptions play out driven by technology that we are still struggling to understand. And a big part of that is a security question. Ultimately, we're you know we've been wrestling with some of that as a health question. We've been wrestling some, with some of that as an economic question. A lot of it also ends up being a security question. Um, it, it, you know, when if you ask uh, it, the national security leaders of the United States today what they are most worried about. Uh, they say three things. They say outer space, uh, artificial intelligence, and human genomic modification. Um, and that uh, all three of those are subjects that we are really only beginning to scr uh, scratch the surface of in terms of thinking about our politics and our policies and our practices and procedures as a society around what those are actually going to end up doing to our lives. 
much of this is being driven by a communication disintermediation that has removed the traditional gatekeepers that many of you remember from earlier in your life. The, uh, the evening news anchors, the morning newspapers, the afternoon newspapers that help provide a agreed upon set of facts that public policy makers could start from. Um, the benefit of this disintermediation ha is that it has allowed for a plethora of new voices you have never heard before uh, and brought all sorts of new people to the table. At the same time, it is creating new challenges for democracies. Um, and we are beginning to understand, um, and we saw this particularly, for instance, with Russia in 2016 in the US election, the ways that open societies can see these technologies and communication strategies weaponized against us uh, by authoritarian regimes that don't see that uh, that, that are not beholden to the same set of rules and norms that we are uh, here uh, in, in the West. So what does that actually mean in terms of, uh, you know, challenges uh, to political society and, and, and geopolitics? So what we are living through right now, I think, are five big interconnected technology and political trends. The first is uh, the global recognition that technology comes with ideology, that um, there was this, uh, I think, original sense that technology was value neutral. Um, you know, it could be used for good, it could be used for bad, but the underlying technology was value agnostic and that that's not actually proving to be the case that what we are actually seeing is that there are all sorts of ideologies baked into the technologies that we are using and adopting in our daily lives um and that uh, there are um uh, 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 where that's beginning to break down at the geopolitical level is you are seeing the rise, uh, you, you're seeing the collapse on the one hand of the idea of a unified global internet. Um, the idea that there was going to be one network available to the whole world and that everyone was going to sign on to the same network. Instead, what you were seeing is basically the world splitting into three different internets, each with a different set of values and a different set of ideologies behind it. Um, the, the US represents one end of that spectrum with an internet that is radically open and unbounded, um, one with far fewer protections for individuals and for privacy and one that dramatically favors the exploitation of user data. Uh, this is sort of the open web as imagined by, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, uh, and, and Google. Um, Europe is trying to develop a pretty different internet. Um, one that puts users at the center of it, puts a much higher value on privacy and where data is much more tightly regulated uh, and, and where there are much stronger guardrails for society uh, around certain kinds of speech, um, which we are seeing play out, um, you know, in the UK and in Europe. Um, you know, the idea that anything goes online is actually not the case in uh, countries like the UK uh, and, and Germany, which have very different histories around uh, government surveillance and uh, the, the danger of dangerous ideas. So then there is a third internet that we are seeing grow up, a third technology tradition uh, grouped around a much more autocratic internet, um, one that is led by Russia and China 
that severely throttles user engagement and news sources and is much more intrusively surveilled by the government. Um, there is uh, a, a fascinating subplot of this that we see playing out in the US dance with companies like Huawei and TikTok um, and the idea that the world may really end up splitting not just into different internets on the front end, but different internets on the back end. That um, the US uh, may build a 5G network, um, which, and I, I'm happy to come back and talk more about this or, 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 uh, or, or any of the other trends that I, I'm talking about today. Um, that uh, where, where basically the U.S. wins its battle against China, uh, but that in a very localized way and that sort of one Internet exists um, basically between the U.S., uh, Canada, uh, Western Europe and uh, Australia, New Zealand and some of the Pacific and that China and Russia basically end up winning the internet in South America, Central America, most of Africa, and most of Asia. Um, and that has really, really profound economic and geopolitical uh, outcomes. The, the second global trend that we are living through, and uh, today uh, 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 with our Zoom talk is a good example of this, is the wiring of technology into every aspect of daily life that the rise of artificial intelligence and the internet of things uh is raising a lot of different complicated questions about the role of humanity and equity in emerging technologies um, and, and it's forcing us to rethink some of the precepts of the way that we have deployed technology in our society over the last 50 years where we have prized first to market technologies and adopted what the Silicon Valley calls um, a minimum viable product. The idea that you go to market with the quickest, dirtiest version of the thing that does the thing that you want it to do. The challenge to that is that we have seen over the last 20 years that we have digitized all of our life's information without putting in place the necessary safeguards around uh, privacy and security to keep that information safe. And we are now repeating all of those same mistakes with our infrastructure, that we are seeing um, uh, basically all of our things go from analog to digital up to and including our gas pipelines, our hospitals, our uh, our water systems um, in, in ways that we are now seeing the attendant risks in events like the colonial pipeline ransomware uh, attack uh, that the East Coast weathered over the last couple of weeks. Um, it is uh, terrifying to me how we are making so many incredibly foreseeable mistakes in the way that we are wiring the world right now um, and uh, introducing powers and technologies to people ill-equipped to uh, uh, assess and understand how to properly use them. Uh, that is, uh, you know, that's everything from uh, digital uh, wired thermometers in your house to uh, uh, to, you know, what we are about to see in terms of driverless cars and automated cars um, on the nation's roads. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I don't know how much you have been following the story of the last couple of weeks that uh, Tesla is finally figuring out that uh, by design or by accident, uh, you don't actually have to have anyone sitting in the driver's seat of a Tesla in order for a Tesla to be uh, driving down the road. Um, and that there is this guy in California who keeps getting arrested, sitting in the back seat of a speeding car going down the interstate with no one in the front seats. 
um, and that Tesla is sort of easily fooled into thinking that there are actually hands on the wheel when there are not. So that's um, an incredibly huge challenge that we are not close to wrestling with uh, appropriately and that we are where we are seeing that security uh, both physical and information cannot just serve as an afterthought. Um, the third trend that we are living through related very much to that sort of splinter net phenomenon of the world cleaving into three separate and uh, disconnected internets is a renewed commitment by the US government and other countries to regulate and police big tech on issues from consumer rights to antitrust. Um, and the, f the, the collapse of the fallacy of the hope that tech companies were somehow more benevolent and better monopolies than monopolies of the past. Um, this is something that we are, um, you know, seeing play out in Congress on a, you know, almost weekly basis right now. Um, and something that uh, is, I think, going to end up being one of the defining political issues of the Biden administration. The, the fifth uh, sorry, the, the fourth big trend that, that I want to mention, um, you know, intersects with everything that I've mentioned so far and everything that I will mention after this, which is the collective poisoning of our information environment as citizens. This is, in, in many ways, to my mind, the biggest threat to uh, the future of our country uh, and the future of the media uh, over the next decade, which is we are seeing um, basically the uh, uh, a, a concerted assault on truth and information uh, playing out in a crisis uh, that has complicated actors, uh, both foreign and domestic, and that our American life right now is increasingly driven and defined by the horrific and the tragic impact of this information crisis, which we are seeing play out in public health. We're seeing it play out in elections. We're seeing it play out at the core of our democracy. And we are seeing it play out on issues like climate change. Um, this is a problem that uh, uh, is increasingly driven uh, that we sort of think of wrongly as the fake news problem, but in fact is a much bigger problem about self-chosen user filters because the biggest challenge of the last five years has not come necessarily from disinformation. It has come from uh, organizations weaponizing truth um, and, and taking true statements and weaponizing them against us uh, in terms of public health questions, in terms of demo uh, democracy questions, in terms of election issues and campaign issues. This is a uh, something that we are struggling with across our information environment. The media industry is struggling with it. The political environment is struggling with it. National security organs are struggling with it. Private companies are struggling with it. Um, you know, w w one of the uh, you know biggest corporate stories of 2021. Uh, Dominion Voting Systems, a company that literally has done nothing wrong and has uh, no documented problems of voter fraud, uh, may ultimately collapse as a company because it is not clear that it is going to be able to survive as a going concern uh, going forward um, after the disinformation campaigns run against it by Republican operatives and the former president, the then president of the United States in the wake of the 2020 election. 
this splintering of information sources also means that it's harder and harder to reach people with information that doesn't conform to their existing worldviews. Um, so phrased differently, what we are seeing is the rising ability of people to simply opt out of challenging ideas. And that is a really, really dangerous place for democracy. Which brings me to the fifth trend that I want to highlight, which is a global trend and turn away from democracy as the future uh, envisioned by young people. Um, that this is in some ways one of the most worrisome geopolitical trends, which is people across the world increasingly do not see democracy as the source of hope for the future. Um, and that here at home in the United States, we are seeing alarmingly rising rates of particularly Republican leaning voters turning away from basic democratic, small d democratic principles uh, in, our, in the functioning of our day-to-day -day democracy. So those are the five big trends that I wanted to set up at the geopolitical and the techno technological level. Let me switch to talk a little bit about the, the ways that some of these problems are playing out in the media environment specifically right now. Um, and, and there are four uh, problem, uh, there's sort of four major trends in the media ecosystem that I, I want to talk about uh, at, uh, uh, tonight. Um, one is the shift from mediums to media, that when you go back and you look at the giants of the news and information ecosystem of the 20th century, they were companies that did one thing well. You know, CBS put out TV news. Uh, Time Life put out magazines. The New York Times put out a newspaper. They, they were definable products. They were definable for consumers. And they were things that you uh, consumed at set times in set locations. You know, you may not read uh, Time Magazine every single week uh, in exactly the same place, uh, but you read, uh, you know, you consumed it every week as a print magazine. You know, the New York Times or the uh, Rutland Herald or the uh, whatever your local newspaper was arrived at the set time uh, that it did every day and you consumed it in more or less the same space in more or less the same way that your neighbors did. Um, you know, the, if you read the Rutland Herald uh, and your neighbors read the Rutland Herald, you would come away with the same set of information uh, and the same set of basic facts that you uh, could all then debate at town meeting. The challenge of uh, going from medium to media is that, you know, none of us necessarily consume the same types of media anymore, um, or, or it doesn't look the same to us. Um, you know, you can be a uh, video watcher on the New York Times website right now. Um, you know, like one of the most amazing pieces of journalism of the day, probably the best piece of journalism this week is a interactive uh, 3D um, illustrated graphic of uh, recreating the Tulsa race massacre of 1921 on the New York Times today. Um, and the, uh, you know, it is a stunning piece of journalism uh, that a huge team of New York Times reporters worked on that would be unrecognizable to anyone who worked at the New York Times 15 years ago uh, and uh, would have been literally unconsumable 
uh, by anyone, uh, you know, it, who was reading the New York Times 20 years ago. Um, the uh, uh, sort of similarly, you know, the New York Times, uh, it, it, two of its biggest projects right now are its daily podcast with Michael Barbaro and its morning email newsletter by David Leonhardt, which has uh, uh, more email subscribers to its morning newsletter than it does print subscribers to the newspaper that all of the rest of the journalists work on. Um, so, you know, your New York Times may look nothing like the New York Times that one of your neighbors or colleagues is reading right now. The second um, trend that I want to talk about on the media level is, uh, uh, well, and, and then obviously, like, that's true for any other news organization that we wanted to talk about, you know, like NPR now does videos and they do podcasts and they do, you know, written uh, investigations that get published on their website. Um, you know, uh, CNN exists in a thousand different forms to a thousand different people on a daily basis. Um, and increasingly, we sort of all choose which way we want to consume media, which makes it much harder for us to all be seeing the same types of stories. The second uh, major challenge that we see uh, is the rise of journalism as a conversation. The um, you know part of uh, uh, those of you who remember Walter Cronkite. Uh, his TV news every night on CBS ended with, and that's the way it is. Because like that actually was the way that it was. And if Walter Cronkite told you something like A, you trusted that he told you the full story and B, there wasn't sort of some other version of the CBS evening news that you could go off and find for yourself to uh, argue with. Um, Tom Brokaw, by the time he finished, uh, or, sorry, um, Brian Williams, when he was doing the NBC Nightly News, uh, he, his finishing tagline was, uh, and join the conversation anytime at NBCnews.com. And it has created this cycle where sort of journalism exists no, less as a finished product and more as an ever evolving conversation with readers where um, you have reporters reacting to people uh, online, you know, incorporating new information that they are finding online. You know, the version of the New York Times story that you read about a breaking news story one hour after the event uh, might be radically different than the version of that same story that comes along, you know, three hours later, four hours later, or appears in the next morning's paper. So this is something where we are uh, really trying to wrestle with the idea that journalists are not uh, necessarily uh, honest brokers uh, uh, of news, that journalists uh, are people too, that they participate in the world, that they come to stories with uh, their own viewpoints. Um, and that's not true so much as, it, that, that's not something that is different today so much as it is uh, something that we are belatedly coming to understand uh, that was wrong about the way that we viewed journalism in the past. That, you know, Walter Cronkite brought all sorts of biases and personal opinions to his evening newscast every month or every night, and we just weren't really thinking about them. We weren't really paying attention to what they were. Um, and that's something that we're seeing much more today. The third big thing I want to talk about on the media trends level is we are seeing journalism split increasingly into two different types of, uh, of journalism, uh, sy systematic and episodic. And that this is something where we are um, 
trying to think through uh, basically media that serves two different types of goals. Um, you have uh, news organizations like Politico that follow things, you know, minute by minute. Uh, and, you know, if you didn't read yesterday's story on the state of the Republican uh, negotiations on the infrastructure bill, you're probably lost uh, in terms of uh, today's story about the infrastructure bill, that they sort of do very small episodic updates following the same story over a much longer period of time. The other end of the spectrum uh, are organizations like uh, 60 Minutes, like um, The Atlantic, like The New Yorker, uh, m magazines uh, and, and magazine-like resources online that provide very broad, high-level, systematic understandings of ongoing stories. Um, and that journalists are increasingly being driven to be sort of either very short or very long um, a a as they try to understand and, and publish information. The the last um, thing that I want to talk about sort of media trends wise is the split between journalism for the elites and journalism for the non-elites, which is to me one of the most troubling uh, threats to our democracy right now, which is the rising trend of information inequality that we are basically seeing uh, journalism be divided into uh, very high, very high price point paid journalism with highly accurate information delivered to people willing and able to pay those high price points and then media for the non-elites, which is sort of this messy jumble of free news that gets smushed and smashed into the web on a daily basis or plays out in your Facebook feeds, in your Twitter feeds, uh, reaching less sophisticated audiences with much less reliability. You know, the truth of the matter is that you, what we are seeing is that different economic classes are accessing different levels and tiers of information today. That you as an individual, as any individual sitting at home today can get more information, can get more access to more information more quickly and more reliably than the president of the United States could in 1985. And yet most Americans, their daily news diet is actually worse than it was in the 1970s, that they are sort of learning less information, less accurately about less things than they did a generation or two ago. But where you are seeing people pay is that you are seeing people pay where information exists effectively as an arbitrage opportunity, where the ability to have more accurate, better information than the person next to you is an opportunity to either make money or keep the money that you have. And so the media that is succeeding on the paid front are places like The Economist, like The New Yorker, like Bloomberg, like Wall Street Journal that aim for very elite, high paid, business focused audiences who need to understand the world in order to make their money. And that this is that this split, sort of what I call, you know, at its most pejorative level, media for rich people and media for poor people is an incredibly dangerous market circumstance for a democracy uh, that effectively at its most basic level is a, 
uh, driven by the idea that citizens can make well-informed choices about their leaders and the direction that they want the country to go in. Um, and so uh, the elite at one end have the ability to filter their information better than they ever have before to access more sources of information from more places anywhere in the world. Um, but meanwhile, sort of poor working class and middle class households today in general are leaving are receiving less accurate information than they would have a generation ago as the collapse of local newspapers and the splintering of the audience of the evening news leads people to be consuming information from different viewpoints uh, uh, than they would have a generation or two ago. Um, so uh, that's what I wanted to sort of throw out um, as uh, my big trends that I'm thinking about uh, in the course of uh, uh, modern media and, and modern politics um, and would love to uh, switch and take some comments and uh, questions from you all. Um, I'm happy to dive into sort of any aspect of this uh, that is uh, of interest or you want to hear more about uh, or, or get more into uh, today's politics if you want to talk about that um, or, or take questions in any other direction. Um, so uh, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself. Um, uh, Anne, uh, I saw your hand go up first. Sure. Um... <laughs> I think you've said you've said so many things um, that it's hard hard to know which which thread to follow. This is absolutely incredible the the synthesis that you put together on so many levels. So I'll just throw out a few things that have kind of grabbed me and some and a question that I'd want to ask you. So the big question I'd want to ask you as a journalist um, who started your career sort of at the beginning or before this all happened and what's happening now and the choices that you're making in your work, um, recognizing all these challenges and the way in which you think about them. So I'd love to know, you know, sort of what you're thinking about doing with your journalism career and talk about, you know, the, the challenges for other journalists that you know who are trying to do the best that they can at the job that they've been given to do. Um, and then specifically, um, I this idea of ideology baked into technology and the splinter net <laughs> and um, the collective poisoning of our information as citizens and this bifurcation of, of advantaged pe educated people versus people who are probably not as well educated technologically as well as um, in current events. Like me, all, you know, those are things that are all of interest to me, but um, take whichever one you want. But the first question um, is maybe an easier one to tackle. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in the context of my work and, and then get into the, the information disorder question, um, which is, um, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, I, to be very blunt, you know, my work exists on sort of the elite end of that spectrum. Um, you know, the, the types of work that I do is that much more systematic understanding of a, a problem or or a challenge um and um so what what i have been trying to uh talk about and highlight in the work that i do is you know the fundamental threat to American institutions that we are living through right now. Um, and um, uh, to, to sort of answer that as a specific question, um, I, I'll back up and talk about um, uh, a, a project that I, I worked on, um, which was the um, my um, in 2017, I wrote a book called Raven Rock that is the story of 
uh, the U.S. government's doomsday plans, basically all of the weird stuff that was going to happen during and after a nuclear attack. And, um, you know, those of you of a certain generation, you know, remember sort of one end of this, which is, you know, the Bert the Turtle duck and cover drills in elementary school. Um, but there was sort of this whole apparatus behind the federal government of um, the idea of, um, you know, preserving the you know, saving the upper echelons of the U.S. government, you know, the, the president, the speaker of the house, the Supreme Court, the cabinet, congressional leaders, this whole network of bunkers that they uh, built around the United States. And in, uh, in the course of that research, one of the most fascinating things that I came across was when the government planners sat down to think about what they wanted to preserve in the event of a nuclear catastrophe in the United States, um, it wasn't just people um, that, you know, this idea of what, what, what do you do if you are going to preserve the United States very quickly becomes this existential question about what is the United States? You know, is, is it a person? Is it the president? Is it, um, a, a, you know, a building? Is it, a, you know, is it the Constitution? Um, and what they actually basically decided was that it's an idea. And so they put an enormous amount of work into saving those historical totems that have bound us together as a nation, generation to generation. Um, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, there were dedicated helicopters through the Cold War whose job it was to evacuate those charters of freedom from the National Archives in the event of a surprise nuclear attack on the United States. The Library of Congress had a ranked list of artifacts of so that they knew that they would uh, save the uh, George Washington's military commission and uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg address, um, you know, before they saved, you know, these other second tier of documents. Um, and in Philadelphia, there was a specially trained team of park rangers whose job it was to evacuate the Liberty Bell in the event of a surprise Soviet attack on the United States. I sort of have this like picture of, you know, these like park rangers, you know, driving off into the mountains of Appalachia with this like swinging Liberty Bell in the back of their pickup truck and then getting to the bunker and being like, no, 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 I swear the crack was there before we left Philadelphia. Um, and what they really decided was that, you know, the United States doesn't have crown jewels. We don't have a royal family. We don't have, um, you know, a, a scepter or a crown that represents what America is. And so what America has is the idea of America. And that as long as you preserve the idea of America, America will live. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the speaker of the house is. What, ma what matters is that Americans continue to believe in the idea of America. And to me, the challenge of the last five years, the last 10 years of American politics is that we have seen a assault on the institutions of the United States uh, freedom of speech, the rule of law, um, the, um, the freedom of the press that, uh, are going to be really, really hard to undo. And that in many ways it is those institutions that are the only thing that we have as Americans to pass along to the future generations. Um, you know, there, that what we need to do right now is to preserve that idea of America and ensure that that idea is able to be passed forward to future generations. 
Um, and so, you know, when I look at the writing and the topics that I try to tackle now, um, it, it is around those issues that I'm trying to center my work, um, that, uh, um, to, to sort of highlight both the threats to the institutions and then also the solutions to those threats. Um, and you know, what I really worry about right now is the idea that you have one political party that is increasingly stepping away from the idea of shared preservation of those institutions, uh, both when in government and when out of government that, um, and, and that becomes a very, very, very dangerous phenomenon. Uh, for a democracy and uh, what is supposed to be a democratic society. Let's see. Yes, Gramps. Uh, you're muted, sir. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, well, I want to, I guess, emphasize something you, you had as one of your points there, and that is the uh, unbelievable changes in technology allocation among countries. You know, I grew up in the days of having my mother tell me about Pearl Buck and the poor starving Chinese. Fast forward 65 years, and then last week I was reading an article in Science Magazine about how the Chinese appear to be taking the lead in supercomputers. Uh, and then the next thing I see is they're landing one of their rovers on Mars. And, and then just as a, a, on a lighter note, I, I read the novel that uh, Admiral uh, Stravitas. Uh, Stravitas did, wrote about uh, you know, the, the potential start of World War III in 10 years where the Chinese had such technology that they were able to take over entire U.S. military systems. Uh, that seems to be an, an enormous threat uh, to us all in, uh, in the fact that we're losing, maybe losing the competition uh, to be able to control our own technical destiny. Yeah, um, and, and so there's a question in the chat um, uh, that's, that's semi-related that I'll, I'll sort of tackle it at roughly the same time um, about how, um, uh, uh, you know, basically every article about China right now is negative. Um, and is it really true that there is nothing good coming out of a, a country of 1.4 billion people? Um, and what I think you are seeing uh, play out in, in sort of both of those cases right now is a recognition and a reckoning that the U.S. policy community uh, across the board, Republican and Democratic, got China wrong over the last 30 years. And that there was this expectation uh, through Democratic and Republican administrations alike, that uh, if you bound China more closely to the global community, that if you brought it into uh, global bodies, if you uh, brought it into global trading networks, um, that you would see uh basically china become more like us um and that it would become more open and more small d democratic as a society and what we have seen instead is that the technology that we have used to drive openness and transparency and accountability in the west uh sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Uh, authoritarian regimes, and China in particular, have used to actually 
uh, execute ever more rigorous and intensive surveillance systems of their own population. Um, and that in fact, um, the biggest challenge of our country right now is that uh, we are becoming more like China than China is becoming more like the United States. And that we have seen these trends uh, driven and accelerated over the last 18 months by the pandemic, um, both in terms of the uh, uh, sort of rising nationalist rhetoric against China, as well as China beginning to deploy the technologies that it has previously only used against its own populations to combat uh, China's image on the global stage. And, and what I mean by that is Russia has long been uh, a user rambunctiously of uh, so-called active measures overseas. Um, you know, Russia is a primary driver of information disorder in the West, um, which is what we saw in 2016 with the Facebook bots and trolls um, uh, from, from the Internet, uh, the Internet Research Agency. And that we have seen China, though, only use those news controls uh, and disinformation, misinformation, malinformation uh, tools to be deployed historically, internally focused on political dissidents and human rights activists inside of China. The crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, the threat of global uh, 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 basically the uh, Chinese culpability for the pandemic uh, has driven China now to begin deploying those techniques that it used to only use internally to also be deploying them externally. Um, and so we are beginning to see China become a major disinformation actor um, on the U.S., uh, sorry, on the world stage outside of China as well. Um, and that China, um, as I mentioned, you know, looks like currently it has a pretty com com commanding lead around next generation technologies like 5G, the next generation of uh, internet uh, connectivity and cell phone connectivity. Um, through companies like Huawei and that uh, they are using very aggressive state subsidies to spread that technology into countries where um, it is, um, uh, where cost is a major driver. Um, and so across Latin America, across Central America, uh, South America, across Africa, um, across developing countries uh, in, in Asia. Um, and, uh, that technology is becoming a core part of the next generation of the internet uh, in ways that was going to have pretty profound implications for the backbone of the internet over the next 20 years. Um, and that that's a really dangerous and challenging environment for the U.S. to be operating in technologically, which is why you are seeing uh, companies uh, uh, like uh, Ericsson and Samsung receive so much support so quickly from Western governments desperate to develop 5G alternatives in the West. Um, you know, we basically the U.S. gave up being a builder of the next generation of technology and then was surprised to discover about five years ago that the only viable option was to buy Chinese technology. Um, and we are now racing to catch up in that and rethink 
the way that the U.S. has handled industrial supply policy um, over the last couple of decades. Uh, and it may very well be that, surprise, our answer ends up looking uh, a lot more like China, that we sort of invest in a lot of uh, companies in uh, at, at a government level um, to try to ensure U.S. dominance in some of these technologies going forward. Lisa. Uh, hi, can you talk, so back to domestic, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, domestic U.S. consolidation of the economic control of the media? We just saw another buyout the other day, and this seems to be another trend that's going on. And, you know, there are political interests behind those. Um, uh, Rush Limbaugh was able to reach 600 different uh, um, media outlets, I believe, every time he spoke. And so can you just talk a little bit more about the the intersection of money behind media ownership and the political interests of those owners? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and uh, Dean Bacay, who is the, or, or um, who's just stepping down uh, soon as the editor um, of the New York Times, um, his answer is uh, to this is that basically he thinks that most local newspapers are going to die in the next five years unless they are bought by a billionaire. Um, sort of full stop, very straightforward media analysis. And that what we are seeing right now is uh, particularly on the newspaper front, the national consolidation that you were speaking of, where um, hedge funds effectively are buying up uh, the dwindling assets of newspapers and uh, with the express business goal of cutting the newspapers faster than readers will cancel their subscriptions. Um, it, it is an incredibly cynical uh, business ploy, but it's a very explicit one, um, which is uh, that these things are highly profitable for a very short period of time. If you put none, uh, you know, if you reinvest none of the resources into them to help them transform into being lasting, uh, longer term organizations with less profit motive. Um, so what we are seeing is, uh, you know, newspapers disappear across the country. Um, and uh, the uh, that is taking place, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in uh, less wealthy communities, it's taking place, particularly in rural communities. Um, and you're seeing the sort of rapid rise of what people have taken to calling news deserts, where there is no one uh, covering local news anymore. And the dream of 20 years ago was that the rise of bloggers was going to solve this all that, you know, every high school, uh, sports game and city council meeting and sewer commission meeting and school board meeting would be covered by bloggers doing it for fun for free. Um, and it turns out that, uh, no one actually wants to show up for school board meetings or sewer commission meetings unless they are paid to do so. Um, and that at a like very fundamental level, we are seeing uh, increasingly large swaths of the United States go completely uncovered. Um, and this has uh, some pretty profound implications for uh, you know, the democracy, but also the quality of government that we are getting. Um, the FBI, uh, w w which is something that I cover a lot, is uh, 
is talking openly about how they need to transfer more resources into public corruption investigations uh, because it turns out that you don't want to know what the sewer commission is willing to do if they don't think anyone is watching anymore. Um, and that that's playing out in communities across the country um, in a way that we don't have a really good answer for right now. Um, and that we are sort of increasingly realizing that we are, um, that the, the sort of good old days of American journalism that we lived through for the last 50 to 75 years um, were the aberration, not the, you know, not the, uh, the model that what we lived through from you know 1950 to uh you know let's say 2000 was a very weird moment where local car dealerships and mattress companies and grocery stores and department stores were willing to subsidize sending reporters to war zones and city council meetings in exchange for reaching, uh, uh, you know, reaching readers with their ads because they had very few other alternatives to do so. Um, now they have a lot of alternatives to do so uh, that don't involve buying a print ad or buying a digital ad. Um, and uh, you are seeing sort of the collapse of a business model without a clear sense of what uh, is going to come next, um, other than, you know, hoping that, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos buys your, your local newspaper and then, you know, gives you a couple of years to turn it into a viable business again. Uh, Julia? Hi there. Um, so my, Gramps is actually my uh, grandfather. Um, I am actually in o Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, he invited me to this conference. I'm actually a local uh, news reporter here in Tulsa, um, local television reporter. Um, and um, distrust in audience and dealing with that situation um, my journalism career was only launched about five years ago, so I have only ever really been a journalist in the wave of fake news and local news dying and, you know, mistrust in the media. Um, and it's something that my company and station at my last station, this station is constantly trying to invest resources in is how to gain trust in our viewers again. Um, it's something that we talk about often. Um, in your opinion, obviously, I know you focus more on print media, but um, what, you know, in your experience, what do you think sort of the solution is to what we're, you know, dealing with in the last couple of years and are definitely going to be dealing with in the future? Um, so uh, it's a great, very tough question. Um, and uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, I, I'm helping manage right now for the Aspen Institute a national commission on information disorder um, that uh, we're hoping to have some recommendations, uh, you know, on how to tackle some of these issues um, by early fall. Um, I, I'm not sure we're actually going to come up with any really good solutions. Um, uh, because I think that what you are seeing is um, a bunch of different things all coming to play at once. Um, on the one hand, we are sort of all collectively waking up to the fact that the institutions, uh, that at a very basic level, the institutions that we are used to trusting um, are not necessarily worthy of the trust that we have long held in them. Um, and that is, uh, that's true on, um, you know, the Catholic church front. 
that is true on the local police front that is true in um the history book front um you know as you are living sort of this week particularly in tulsa that sort of like the story of american history as we have been taught it and told it um you know in uh generations of our history books is not the you know the, that we sort of tell ourselves a better version of our history than we probably deserve um so sort of some of this is like actually we should be questioning our institutions more than we do the second level of this is like you need in a democracy for people to have a shared shadow of the future um you know that we you know that you as a participant in our society when you are in power don't destroy the guardrails of our democracy while you are in power because you imagine that someday you will be out of power and you want those guardrails still there to be your protection when you are out of power um and we have a party right now that is deciding that they're not willing to agree with that shadow of the future that they are sort of willing to destroy short-term guardrails of democracy uh to hold on to power in the short term uh even at the cost of sort of a healthy functioning democracy in you know five years 10 years 15 20 years down the road um that's a really dangerous thing and that's like not something that we can uh you know that that's not something that like we can fix with like improving third grade civics education um which is like one of the answers that we need to get civics back into schools and like yes that would be great but like i don't really know that we have time to like wait for the third graders to grow up and like take care of this problem like 25 years from now um the other thing it, that it, that we need to wrestle with and this is what comes back to sort of that question about antitrust and corporate regulation of technology is that we have agglomerated an enormous amount of power in democracy and media to people who are not particularly interested in caring about democracy or the media um it, you know uh facebook's highest work is not uh preserving american democracy <laughs> um and uh you know facebook uh is you know and i can sort of give it like real cliched uh answer about the way that social media drives us to extremes because what it is interested in is uh, increased engagement um, and so you know if you try to stay super balanced it's going to keep pushing you to um, you know more extreme reviews um, do you know how most people uh, who end up on white supremacist videos on YouTube get to them YouTube recommends them uh, that they should start watching more white supremacist videos because they started watching videos that were sort of adjacent to white supremacist videos um and that's that's really bad like that's a really hard thing to address um when you have companies that are just fundamentally not interested in doing so um you know i it, i don't know how many of you are facebook users um, but Facebook knows exactly what it's doing. Um, it has a quality algorithm 
that it turned on for the couple of weeks around the election to ensure that people got more accurate, better information from more trustworthy sources. They turned it off after the election was settled and then uh, turned it back on in the wake of the January 6th insurrection. Um, and so like Facebook on a daily basis knows how to do what it is doing in a better way for democracy and our country, and it chooses not to. And like, that's not, uh, like that's not going to get changed unless we change the incentive structure for Facebook. Um, and, and I think sort of the answer that I would give you sort of writ large there um, is, the challenge that we hear sort of day in day out right now is the system is broken um and it's not like if i can sort of leave you with like one big picture thought about american life right now the system is absolutely working in exactly the way that the system is designed to work we are just not currently happy with the results of the system and so if we're unhappy with the system, we need to change the incentive structures to come up with a different result. But when you look around the United States right now, um, like we shouldn't be looking at it as a system that is broken. We should be looking at it as a system that is delivering exactly the results the system is designed to do. Yeah. All right, could you address, there's two questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, future. Um, so, uh, um, uh, um, all right, so let me go back up here a little bit. Um, uh, Stephen has a, a question um, about sort of getting a handle on the splintering of information sources. Um, and, uh, you know, building on the answer that um, I, I gave, uh, um, I, I just gave Julia, um, I think part of this is, you know, we just need to be better consumers as well. Um, you know, uh, Americans are actually remarkably bad at recognizing uh sort of what they should trust and who they should listen to um and that's something that we see on facebook that's something that we see in daily news um you know part of what makes the QAnon conspiracy theory so dangerous is that it's actually based on people doing their own research that that sort of do your do your research is the like slogan of the QAnon movement um, and that we have this sort of unique thread uh, in our lives right now where Americans are sort of beholden to conspiracy theories uh, that are demonstrably false, but there is enough information out there um, that uh, sort of backs it up that anyone who looks at it can can tackle and i think that this um this is something that i'm sort of been thinking a, a lot about um and and, and julia in, in your sort of tv work um there's probably a version of this question to to think about as well which is you know how do you tackle combating false information without achieving the desired outcome of the people spreading the false information, which is to introduce confusion and messiness around subjects where there actually isn't confusion and messiness. Um, and that this is something that I don't, I don't think the media is really struggling to, to comprehend right now. Um, in part because there's a, there's a weird negative incentive built into some of this right now, 
where some of these ideas are so clearly farcical that reputable news organizations, reputable journalists don't bother wasting time to try to combat them. You know, like the core of the QAnon conspiracy is the idea that um, Hillary Clinton and George Soros are running a series of child sex trafficking rings out of the basement of a pizza joint in Northwest Washington. Um, that's something that is so patently absurd uh, that at the start, there weren't a lot of journalists who were like, I'm here in Comet Ping Pong in uh, Northwest Washington to show you there is in fact no basement here. Um, it, and, it, you know, like, there weren't a lot of people being like, hey, so I just want to talk about like the various reasons that like Hillary Clinton and George Soros are unlikely to be involved in a child sex trafficking ring. Um, but the problem is that those ideas then are able to spread because there's no one actively refuting them. Um, that takes place on this like super macro level and also on the micro level. Um, I, I had um, sort of a... Uh, one of these disinformation campaigns run against a friend of mine who was going into the Biden administration um, a, a couple weeks ago that I wrote about on Twitter that saw um, uh, that I finally ended up like stepping in and trying to refute because I was like, this is so absurd that there's not going to be any piece that anyone bothers writing saying that none of these things are actually true. And so anyone who actually ever Googles this woman ever again is only going to ever get the like patently absurd conspiracy theory write-ups about her um, because, you know, no one bothered to ever refute this. Um, and I don't know how we sort of struggle with that and uh, deal with that going forward. So, well, in the grand card, uh, tradition of car talk, uh, you have managed to waste uh, 90 minutes with me somehow uh, in on a beautiful summer Vermont evening or late spring uh, Vermont evening. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for being here. I don't know where all that time went. Um, and I'm sure we could keep talking for much longer. Um, but thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, and chatting with me tonight um, and I hope I'll get a chance to come down and see you all in person as the world reopens. Okay. Garrett, I want to thank you as well um, for joining us and uh, thank everyone for being here with us. Have a good night, everyone.